When I was a young man I enjoyed going for walks through my small town. Though I'd lived in Red Elm all my life, I never grew bored of its landscape. I loved to bask in the fresh air as I walked, the sun warming my skin and a gentle breeze rifling through my hair. I waved at every person that crossed my path and had a smile on my face more often than not. Life wasn't perfect, of course, and my journeys on foot weren't entirely by choice, I had little money and didn't own a vehicle. But the future looked bright, I'd recently completed high school and started working at the town's only grocery store, and I knew in time I'd be able to save up enough to afford a down payment on a modest car. Unlike my classmates who'd left small town life behind in the days following our graduation ceremony, I had no desire to ever leave Red Elm. I didn't lack ambition, I was simply happy. To me the thought of spending the rest of my days in the town I called home sounded like tranquil, uncomplicated bliss. Later I would reflect on this optimism and feel stupid. Sunlight had yet to peer through my window when a frazzled co-worker called to ask if I could cover her shift. Her son had become ill during the night and she had rushed him to the hospital, leaving her unable to come into work and our store short-staffed. Eager to make some extra money, I told her I'd be there and speedily dressed. Hunger gnawed at me as I walked to work. I'd been in such a rush that I didn't have time to eat. I thought of the egg and sausage sandwiches the store's deli served for breakfast and my stomach growled audibly, if I got there early enough, I'd have time to quickly devour one before my shift began. There was a shortcut through a nearby pasture that I usually avoided but would get me to the store with minutes to spare. It was untended and overgrown, likely teeming with rodents and serpents and other small creatures an unassuming foot would loathe to step on. Though the idea of such an encounter was enough to make me shudder, I didn't want to spend a lengthy shift combating an appetite that roared louder with every passing hour. I decided to cut through the pasture, a choice that would have a staggering, irreversible effect on my life. I could practically taste the coffee I was planning to drink when I tripped over something unseen. I let out a yelp of surprise before regaining my balance, praying that I hadn't incurred the wrath of anything fanged or venomous. I looked down and saw a human hand, its rigid, pale fingers adorned with painted nails like slender pink ovals. Shock seized me. I gasped and stumbled backwards, my heart racing as I stared in disbelief at the horrifying discovery my clumsy foot had uncovered. With shaking hands I parted the waist-high grass to find a woman lying there, the rising sun reflecting glassily in her lifeless eyes. Crushed blades of grass rested beneath her body and clung to her long blonde hair. Her waxen lips were slightly parted, as if she'd been in the middle of her final sigh when she died. The woman's askew legs were bruised and she was barefoot, her toes polished with the same delicate shade as her fingernails. A bloom of blood had blossomed above her heart, staining the fabric of her pearl-colored dress with crimson. I remember running home and babbling my panic into the phone. Officers arrived shortly afterwards, bringing with them yellow crime scene tape and questions. I answered them all as best as I could in my rattled state. I explained that happening upon her was the result of taking a shortcut on my way to work, but they insisted I accompany them to the police station anyway. I was in no position to decline. The interrogation lasted for hours. I never stopped professing my innocence. It wasn't until they spoke to my boss and co-worker both of whom confirmed I'd been unexpectedly called into work that morning, that the police finally started to believe me. The local coroner soon strengthened my alibi. He determined that the woman had likely been killed during the previous evening while I was working a shift that began at noon. The store's security cameras confirmed that I never left the premises until I headed home at around 11 o'clock, making it impossible for me to have committed the murder. Back then DNA technology was still in its rudimentary stages but I provided them with both a sample and my fingerprints, neither of which appeared on the woman's body. To my great relief, I was no longer considered a suspect. But my troubles had only just begun. Though I was innocent in the eyes of the law, the rest of Red Elm was far less charitable. Rumors spread throughout town like pestilence. Accusations were whispered into the ears of anyone who would listen. At work the customers who I'd so often greeted with a smile now averted their eyes or fixed me with an acidic, distrusting glare. Many of my co-workers avoided being in my presence while others politely tolerated me with apparent wariness, fidgeting and uncertain of what to say. Even my boss, a man I was proud to work for and considered to be a father figure, seemed visibly uncomfortable around me. People I thought were my friends turned their backs to me, afraid of being tarnished by my undeserved reputation. I felt unwelcome everywhere I went. One day I came home to discover that my front door had been vandalized. Killer! streaks of bright red paint spelled out furiously. Get out. My landlord charged me for the damage. I didn't protest, afraid of severing my already tenuous grasp on my lease. The stigma of renting to a purported murderer had a mitching for a reason to be rid of me. 
I felt like I was wasting away with every passing day. The walks I had once looked forward to now felt arduous. Every step that brought me near the pasture was a reminder of the tragedy I'd unearthed and how it had so drastically altered the course of my life. I thought of the woman constantly. What was her name? Where was she from? Did she have hopes and dreams and people who loved her before someone took her life and left her out to rot in unkempt grass? Were it not for my co-worker's fevered child in my empty stomach, she might have lied there undetected for years. I followed the meager coverage of the case in Red Elm's small local paper and learned that a stalled investigation had so far failed to uncover her name, much less the identity of her killer. She was buried in an unmarked grave, many times I considered placing flowers on it but feared the act would be interpreted as an admission of guilt and create a spectacle. Eventually not even my nights were spared from the misery that had consumed every other facet of my existence. I began to dread closing my eyes, afraid that I would be assailed by yet another vivid, unrelenting nightmare the instant I drifted off to sleep. Each terrible dream consisted of me lying helplessly frozen in bed as the scent of grass and soil permeated the air. The woman would hover above me, so close that her dangling hair brushed against my terrified face. Her forlornity was palpable. She wept, sobs of grief racking through her pale body as tears rained down sharply on my skin like shards of ice. I would grip my sheets in fright and feel only clods of pasture dirt between my fingers instead. Please, I begged night after night, tell me what I can do to stop this. But she never said a word. The years dragged on, each of them lonely. As the internet's landscape grew, so did my desire for answers. One particularly melancholic afternoon I worked up the courage to head to the library and use their computer. I glanced cautiously over my shoulder and held my breath as I typed the case information into a search engine, hoping to discover new developments. It was then that I learned the hideous rumors I'd been unable to shrug off for so very long had made their way onto local message boards, where they were poured over by prying eyes and subjected to speculation. Nearly every post was filled with fantastical, outright lies. I saw him at the post office the other day. He gave me such an evil look. You think that's bad? A friend said she overheard him gloating about getting away with it when she was doing her grocery shopping. And to think they still let him work at that store. We can only hope that something strikes him down before he hurts someone else, if he hasn't already. I feel so terrible for that poor girl. Refresh my memory, what was her name again? I walked out of the library, went home, and packed my bags. Though I was sickened by the gossipers who had congregated to spread fabrications and stoke the salacious flames of outrage, the person I was most angry with was myself. I was a fool to have ever believed that I could have a second chance at life in Red Elm. My idealized view of my hometown had tainted my perspective, I saw now that the people of Red Elm would never forgive me for the crime I hadn't committed, and no amount of patience would ever bring the finger pointing to an end. The revelation was crushing but freeing for it allowed me to at last see that my only real option was to start over somewhere new. I drained my savings account and left town in the middle of the night, telling no one of my plans. I acquired a new name using a method that wouldn't leave behind a trail for vultures to follow. Hair dye, glasses, and a scruffy beard disguised my features enough to render me unrecognizable. With my departure came a promise I made to myself, that I must never again look up the case online. I would never be able to move forward with my life so long as I continued to glance back at the ruins of my past smoldering behind me. When I laid my head onto a motel room pillow and closed my eyes, I expected to resume the familiar nightmares. To my great surprise, I slept peacefully for the first time in years. At the time social media was limited to internet bulletin boards and blogs considered archaic by today's standards, making it easier to hide my former identity and harder for others to find me. I settled a few towns over and into another small community. I worked a series of odd jobs before discovering my hidden talent at carpentry. An apprenticeship granted me the opportunity to forge a new career with my own hands. Soon I'd earned my first contract and began to make more money than I'd ever made before. By then the bad dreams had ceased entirely. Eventually I met a woman named Claire when her family hired me to do some woodwork on their home. She was wealthy, educated, and well-traveled, in other words, we had nothing in common. But in spite of our differences, we fell deeply in love. Claire sensed that there was a darkness inside of me, though she never pressed for details. One night I was on the verge of telling her everything, but she only shook her head and told me that whatever had happened back then didn't matter to her. It was the man I was today that she loved. I proposed shortly afterwards. We married and built a home together on a remote patch of land. I woke up every morning with the same sort of bliss I'd felt during those long ago days of my youth. There was always a fear that I'd be found out, that I'd lose everything I held dear all over again. 
Though I was happy beyond measure, I still lived each day in a state of caution even as time marched on without incident. I never forgot about the woman in the pasture, how could I? But I held my ground and remained firm, and for almost 20 years I never strayed from my vow. Then I learned I was sick. My diagnosis was grim. I was informed that I didn't have much time left, and that there was little that could be done besides keeping me comfortable. Life became a succession of pills and appointments. It wasn't long before I found myself bedridden. That's when the nightmares returned. The terror I felt when the woman reappeared in my dreams was indescribable. The years had done nothing to soothe her pain, they'd only made her angry. The tragic beauty she'd possessed that morning in the pasture had now withered away into a skeletal grimace. Her decomposed skin resembled thin parchment, as if the slightest touch would undoubtedly pierce through the fragile surface of her flesh and sink into the decaying organs inside. Insects writhed along her scalp and festered in the brittle strands of her hair. The overwhelming stench of rot filled my nostrils. Though she no longer had eyes, I could feel her gaze of hatred bear into me. She was as silent as ever, but her message rang clear, I would be joining her soon. The dreams continued as my health declined. I felt as if I were being consumed by an intense torment that would kill me before my disease did. I decided to break the promise I'd made nearly two decades ago, if I found out everything I could about my life's greatest mystery, perhaps the nightmares would once again vanish and I could spend my remaining days in peace. I waited for Claire to fall asleep before I grabbed my phone. This time the search results were more expansive. While I was saddened, though not particularly surprised, to see that the woman was still unidentified and her killer never captured, I managed to find a blog post written about the crime that contained information I hadn't read before. I scrolled through the page hungrily. One of the strangest aspects of this cold case is the bloody deer ring found clutched in Jane Doe's left hand. The victim's own ears weren't pierced, leading police to theorize that the jewelry belonged to someone else. This information was only made public after a journalist covering unsolved murders in the region obtained the case file. The Red Elm Police Department was subsequently criticized for what was perceived as a mishandling of the investigation, little information was provided to the press, and the only suspect left town before seemingly vanishing into thin air. At the time authorities weren't able to extract a viable DNA sample from the earring. The journalist discovered that the jewelry was later lost, with law enforcement describing their failure to preserve evidence as regrettable. My phone slid from my grasp and landed on the floor with a loud clatter. Claire stirred beside me. What's wrong? She murmured sleepily. Dread guided my gaze to the jagged scar trailing down Claire's earlobe. Darling? Her eyelids began to flutter open. Are you alright? I thought of a life I'd had long ago in Red Elm. I thought of the new existence I'd carved for myself that would soon be coming to a close as I approached my final days. I thought of everything that I'd lost and mourned and everything that I'd gained and treasured. I thought of my wife, who I loved more than anything, and of the woman in the pasture, who I had never stopped thinking about ever since that fateful morning. Why did you do it, Claire? I asked softly. Her body stiffened. A feeling of doom washed over me. I knew in that devastating moment that I was right. An eternity of silence passed before Claire finally spoke. After all this time, she said quietly, her voice so unnervingly calm that it sent a chill slithering down my spine, does it even matter? My face felt wet. I realized I was crying. Does, does anyone else? Does anyone else know? She finished for me. Yes. My parents. I felt as if the world had begun to crack apart around me. The flicker of warmth in Claire's eyes that had greeted me every morning throughout our years of marriage was now gone, replaced by a cold, passionless stare. The truth is I've never understood why I have these urges, she continued in an even tone, as if we were discussing a casual subject. They've been there for as long as I can remember. Mom and Dad taught me how to keep them quiet and hidden, but when I got older they eventually grew too loud to ignore. My heart pounded in my chest. I felt as if I couldn't breathe. Who was she? I asked dizzily. A drifter passing through town, Claire answered with a shrug. If she ever told me her name, I can't remember it now. She sat up and stared at me with an expression that made my stomach twist into knots of tension. I suppose you want to know what happened. I nodded weakly. I met her at a bar. I was drinking a lot back then. Alcohol wasn't a flawless distraction, but it helped. Claire ran a hand through her hair and gazed ahead. She told me that she was leaving in the morning and wanted some company in the meantime. Said she didn't like to be alone. We drove around for hours, drinking and talking. Eventually we wound up on a dirt road. She was drunk by then and said she felt like she was going to be sick. 
she got out of the car and kicked off her shoes before stumbling into a nearby field. As I followed her into the tall grass, it occurred to me that it was unlikely anyone would miss her. Claire frowned, as if lingering on a memory that brought her no pleasure. Afterwards I went home and told my parents what I did. Mom cried while Dad yelled at me for being sloppy. They cleaned up my mess and made sure money was placed in the right hands. Neither of them have looked at me the same way since. Mom wanted to send me away. But Dad? Claire sighed. You know how Dad is. He wouldn't hear of it. Anything to keep up appearances. Every fiber of my being trembled from a surge of emotions, shock, betrayal, disgust. You ruined my life, I whispered. I know, Claire replied without hesitation. But I tried to make it right. I stared at her in confusion. Beads of sweat trickled down my forehead. What are you talking about? Claire raised her brows and gave me an incredulous expression, as if mystified at how I had failed to understand something exceedingly obvious. Sweetheart, she said coolly, where do you think all your job contracts came from? I felt as if a bucket full of ice water had been flung into my face. Claire reached forward to caress me and I recoiled, nearly becoming entangled in the sheets as I tumbled out of bed. Careful! Claire exclaimed. Remember what the doctor said about overexerting yourself. I earned those contracts before I even met you. I gasped defensively, pain searing through my chest. Claire rolled her eyes. Why does it matter to you how you got them? Haven't you enjoyed making money? Didn't you feel like you deserved it after everything you've been through? I gripped my bedside table and shakily rose to my feet. You're lying, I protested falteringly, my skin so slick with perspiration that my bedclothes had grown damp. She shook her head. No, I'm not. We've been watching you ever since Dad's contact at the Red Elm police station called to tell him that you were brought in for questioning. When you came here it was the perfect opportunity to make life easier for you. Dad made certain you were given everything you needed for your career to advance. Why? Why would you do that? Because you staying content and busy meant you were less likely to think about questions that we didn't want to have answered. It worked, didn't it? My knees buckled. I braced against the wall to keep myself from falling. Is that why you married me? I asked faintly. So I'd always be within reach to manipulate like a puppet? Yes, Claire answered unflinchingly. But you don't have to look at it so cynically. In a way, you and I became linked the moment you decided to walk through that pasture. I stumbled towards the doorway, but in my weakened state Claire was much faster. In the blink of an eye she'd thrown me onto the floor. I gasped as a fresh burst of pain shot through my chest. Stop it! Claire demanded. I don't want this to be any more unpleasant than it has to be. She began to rummage through the bedside drawer filled with my prescriptions. Why are you doing this? My voice was so frail that I could barely hear myself. Don't you love me? Claire's eyes glimmered in the darkness of the bedroom. She loomed over me with a medicine bottle in her hand. Open your mouth, she commanded menacingly. I feebly swatted at her, but she pinned me down effortlessly. I pressed my lips tightly together, tears running down my cheeks. You did this to yourself, Claire stated coldly. I gave you everything you could have ever wanted and made it so you'd never have to struggle again. All you had to do was leave the past where it belonged and not get fixated on some worthless, nameless, dead. Suddenly Claire froze. The bottle fell from her grasp and spilled onto the floor. No, she whispered. It can't be. I turned my head and saw the woman from the pasture creeping towards us, every bit as decayed and full of rage as she was in my dreams. I tried to scream, but the only sound that escaped my mouth was a rattling wheeze. Powerless to stop her, I squeezed my eyes shut in defeat and awaited whatever agony she would inflict upon me. But I felt nothing. When I opened my eyes again I saw that the rotting woman had moved past me and was heading for Claire, who was now helplessly pressed against the wall, her face contorted into an expression of horror. I'd never seen her afraid before. Get away from me! Claire shrieked. She leapt over my prone form and lunged for the doorway, only to scream when the woman sank her skeletal fingers into Claire's ankle. She fell to the floor and crawled into the hallway, leaving behind a trail of blood droplets. The woman followed. I shut my eyes again when I heard the sound of flesh tearing. Something wet dripped onto the floorboards. Claire's tortured screams rang throughout the house before she mercifully fell silent. I summoned what remained of my strength to slowly drag myself along the floor towards my phone. I was reaching for it when a gentle hand touched my shoulder. I looked up and saw the woman leaning over me. This time she was spectrally beautiful. Her flesh was once again intact and smooth where it had been ruined by rot only moments ago, and her formerly withered features had been returned to her. 
The colorless death that had overtaken her in the pasture was now replaced with a warm glow radiating throughout her body. She smiled at me, her eyes full of sympathy and understanding. I knew then that she meant me no harm. I'm sorry for what happened to you, I whispered. I looked down into the screen of my phone. There was no one I wished to speak to and no questions that I wanted to answer. I could already feel my life beginning to ebb away. I glanced back up at the woman. I don't want to die alone, I told her. Will you stay with me? Please. She nodded. By the time you read this, I'll be dead. After spending most of my existence either being disbelieved or having to hide, I've decided to dedicate my final hours to writing down my story. I want others to know the truth about what happened, not only for my sake, but because in an unmarked grave in a small, quiet little town there lies the body of a woman who deserves justice. I implore you to never forget her. I am no longer scared to die, for I know that when I close my eyes for the last time I'll find myself in Red Elm. It'll be just like it was when I was young, a peaceful smile will spread across my lips, I won't feel any pain, and the sun will shine on me once more. I'm coming home.